Buenas tardes a todos, quiero darles la bienvenida, agradecerles por acompañarnos en este evento. Mi nombre es Alejandra Zapata y hago parte del equipo de Consejería Académica y Relaciones Internacionales de Colfuturo. Hoy nos acompaña Zoe, quien es representante de University of Melbourne. Nos estará brindando información en esta sesión acerca de la oferta académica que tienen disponible, cómo pueden iniciar su postulación. Eh, también nos va a estar hablando un poco de, la, de las opciones de financiamiento que hay y también hablará un poco del convenio que tienen actualmente con Colfuturo, el cual da un descuento del 15% en el valor de la matrícula para beneficiarios en programas de Melbourne School of Design y en Graduate School of Humanities and Social Science. Adicionalmente, un descuento del 25% para estudiantes en Melbourne Graduate School of Education y 10% para las demás facultades. Es importante mencionar que hemos beneficiado a más de 294 personas a lo largo de la historia de Colfuturo y específicamente el año pasado fueron 47 los beneficiados. Es una oferta muy recurrente entre los estudiantes y esperamos que esta información sea de mucha utilidad para todos ustedes. Al final vamos a tener un espacio de preguntas y respuestas. Entonces, si en algún momento de la presentación tienen alguna duda, la pueden escribir en inglés, que al final Zoe les va a dar respuesta. Quiero recordarles que esta sesión hace parte de una serie de eventos que vamos a tener durante el mes de septiembre con algunas universidades alrededor del mundo. Entonces, si se perdieron de algún evento, de algún webinar, lo pueden encontrar en nuestro canal de YouTube. Pueden seguirnos en nuestras redes, Instagram, Facebook y Twitter. Y toda esta programación la pueden encontrar en nuestra página web colfuturo.org. So, thank you so much for joining us, for your time and for your interest to present the institution. So, please, you can start. Thanks so much for having me, Alejandra. I have a special guest with me who I'm going to be introducing a little later. But first, we're going to get started with giving you a little bit of an idea about what Melbourne is all about, because it's all about finding the right fit for you. So I'm just going to share my screen with you and we'll get started really soon. So what we're going to do is we're going to put your future in focus today. And one of the first things I would love to say to you is Womanjika or welcome to Melbourne. And that's our First Nations people's word for welcome. And before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I join you today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So for those of you unfamiliar with Australian culture, what you just experienced was an acknowledgement of country. And it's something really important to us in Australia and at the University of Melbourne. It's our way of recognising our first people's enduring connection to country, which is apparently up to 50,000 years. So it's something that you will experience if you studied at the University of Melbourne or another Australian university. So let's begin. I know that you're all at very different stages of your student journey. Some of you may just be thinking about what might I want to do for graduate study. Some of you may be narrowing down between a few courses and some of you may be just a little unsure. So I'm going to give you a bit of a taste about what Melbourne is about and introduce my very special guest later who actually came to us from Colombia to study. She's now got a really great job and she's going to have a chat with me to you a little later on. So the first thing I want to do is I want to tell you a story. And I think that this story sums up the University of Melbourne. And one of the most important things that you can be doing is thinking about where can I study that's going to be a good fit for me? Where can I study that is going to give me the opportunities that I want and set me up for a sustainable career? Now, we've all heard the saying that you're going to work in jobs that don't even exist yet. And that is absolutely true. And with the shifts that we've been seeing around the world as a result of the pandemic, we're seeing this change to more digital jobs. We're seeing this change to hybrid jobs. We're seeing different industries shift. So uh, looking at how spaces work when we need to consider distance, 
looking at different ways of delivering healthcare, looking at different ways of building cities, smart cities, and different ways of teaching and learning. So we're seeing that rapidly progress. But let's start with this story, and it's one of my favourites. And chances are, if you've met me before, you may have heard this one, but maybe not in this way. So on your screen is a little baby, and this little baby is actually very unwell. Now, this little baby is suffering from pneumonia, and this may shock people because often when we think of pneumonia, we think of the sick, we think of the frail, we think of the elderly even. But in fact, pneumonia is the leading cause of mortality in children under the age of five. And this poor little baby is actually suffering from that. Now, your next thought might be, but can't we give penicillin or antibiotics? Isn't that what you do about pneumonia? Well, in fact, you need medical grade oxygen. And it requires not only a skilled healthcare practitioner to deliver it to the patient, but it also requires an uninterrupted supply of electricity to generate that life-saving treatment. So what do you do if you're in a country where the power shuts down? What do you do if you live in a remote region where it's just actually not available to you? And this is the very reason why pneumonia is the leading cause of mortality in children under the age of five. So researchers at the University of Melbourne decided this isn't good enough. There is a perfectly good treatment and people should be able to have access to this. So they didn't want to change the treatment, but they wanted to make it possible for remote settings, for lower resource countries. And pneumonia is actually not the leading cause of mortality in children in Australia or Colombia. And so there's a bit of a clue in there that I'll sum up in a moment. So who do you think worked on this particular challenge? Maybe doctors, frontline medical staff, perhaps designers, so that they could look at what the actual unit would be. Maybe public health, maybe people that work in cultural settings to know whether the treatment would be accepted. Engineers. Well, all of those people got together to tackle this challenge. And their research leader was actually a physicist. And they used classic physics to draw water from a water source, like a well or a river. And they were able to generate the electricity through pure physics. They created a device that was light, cheap, which was really important, and portable and it could be used by people really simply. This is Frio 2 and it is one of our incredible global impact stories, but there's a few clues in there for you. This particular project won Australia's top science prize. And I was actually at a function with Professor Roger Rasool, who was the lead researcher, so the physicist. And I said, congratulations, Roger. And he said, the prize is great, but we're more excited that we saved 26 babies' lives in Uganda last month. So why do I tell you this as my opening story? My story that I want you to see if there's a fit for you at Melbourne. Well, number one, there was the clue in the idea that pneumonia isn't the leading cause of mortality in Australia. We are globally focused. So we're not just focusing on what's happening in Australia. We do that too, but we are tackling big challenges throughout the world. Clue number two is this idea of interdisciplinarity. So the people involved in this project came from engineering, from design, from medicine, from the arts and humanities and social sciences that could look at people's views and attitudes towards treatments and from physics. Now, this is something really important to us at the University of Melbourne. No matter what you are studying in our graduate programs, your subjects, the courses and who's teaching you are all highly considered. So we like to bring together experts 
from different faculties to teach your courses. Now, it's proven that people who are designers, engineers, scientists, teachers, artists, learn and think and approach problems in different ways. And you'll see a lot of incidences of this at the University of Melbourne, where we pull together interdisciplinary teams. And sometimes some of our collaborators are from universities in other countries or other universities in Australia. So we work quite closely with the group of eight in Australia, because for us, collaboration is a really important way of being able to tackle different problems. So that's something that we embed into your learning, no matter what your course is. So if you were doing a Master of International Relations or Development, you will have experts from the Melbourne Law School teaching you about international law, about policy. If you are doing economic development units, you will have experts from Melbourne Business School. You will have data science from the Faculty of Science, depending upon the subjects that you are teaching. Some of the subjects that you do, you'll have students that might be doing other courses that your subjects might be a really strong elective for them. So what we like to do is get you in the classroom with people that learn and think in different ways. And this is about setting you up for a sustainable career to work in jobs that don't exist yet, because we're building these really important skills about interdisciplinary, knowing what you can draw from another expert, knowing what you can also think in a different way when everyone else in your project team is stumped over how can we solve this problem. And I think overall, the last point of this story is the sense of ambition. So we're tackling these huge global issues very successfully. And we know where we need to reach out to get connections. But importantly, it goes right down to classroom level. So Professor Roger Rasool, who led this research, teaches students right from undergraduate first year and into graduate coursework and research programs right through to postdoctoral fellows. So you really will be learning from some of the top researchers we don't just hide them away in a lab. They're excited to share their passions with you. And it's also your classmates. So again, you will be in classes with students with different backgrounds, different perspectives, and that too challenges you and adds uh, to, again, your toolkit for building a sustainable career. So one of those things that people are looking for is that cross-cultural competence that creative and novel thinking, that digital literacy, and that interdisciplinary. And this is inbuilt into your course, no matter what you want to do, from a Master of Laws to a Master of Education or Teaching to International Relations and Development, Engineering, Sustainability, anything that you can think of, we are highly considered in those opportunities. One of the next stories I would like to tell you about Melbourne, this is first commissions. So if we have any artists out there, or if you're thinking about design, um, designing sustainable or smart cities or design from the sense of engineering, we give you opportunities to practice and meet people that can help you launch your career. So a really big part for us, about not only opening up the world to you, opening up your thinking is giving you opportunities to practice. So in this particular picture on your screen, we gave students their very first commission. So as a former fine arts student, when someone wants to pay you to make a work for them, it's incredible. So we got these students to respond to some of the great artists of our time, Frida Kahlo, Bob Dylan, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and they were paid. But not only that, their work was launched globally. So it was shown throughout the world. These were dance pieces, fine arts pieces, music, painting, sculpture. But the students were surprised and taken to Rome to launch it. 
So these are the things that we like to do in everything that we're doing. If you were doing design or architecture, your work will be exhibited to the public and to industry. You will practice your skills. In this instance, we connected and launched our students all over the world. And this is what gives reputation. So no matter what you're doing in a graduate course, you will have opportunities for internships. You will have special opportunities like this. You will have specialist classes depending upon what you're doing. If you're doing teaching or medicine, you will go out on placements to practice what you are learning. And that builds connections to help you in getting your jobs. So we do lots of things, mentoring, connect you to alumni, connect you to industry, and allow you that space and time to develop your skills. The final quick story is this is the Great Barrier Reef. It's one of the world's seven natural wonders. And sadly, this here is not so pretty. This is coral bleaching. And it's actually the Great Barrier Reef dying. And it's due to climate change. And in this instance, it's sea level temperatures rising. So what we did was with another interdisciplinary team and students at all different levels in their learning from undergraduate to graduate, were able to go out and do field work up in the Great Barrier Reef and the lead researcher bioengineered heat resistant coral to introduce back into the reef. This means it was tough. It can withstand the effects of climate change and be here for generations to come. Now, why do I tell you this final story? I tell you it because it's kind of proof of our future thinking. Environment, sustainability, and climate change has something that we've researched and had embedded within our courses for well over 30 years. Um, it, it's, it's more around 35 years. So as this was becoming a crisis, the university responded. It's a really strong theme throughout what we do, but it's also an example of watching where the needs and the challenges are and being right across what we need to do. So you'll see a lot of themes to do with um, sustainability and the environment at the University of Melbourne, but this is also a good opportunity to show you the kinds of field trips and research that students can get involved on. But that's something that really demonstrated our forward thinking. And we were one of the first to introduce those environment programs and, and such an intensive view on the research. So we are always thinking about these things. Now, we have some lovely rankings on the screen there for you. And what I would say is that it's those people, it's that spirit, it's that consideration of what we teach you in your courses, the subjects that we develop, the way we deliver it, but it's the stories of those people behind these rankings. It's not a coincidence. It's all of these things coming together. One of the things that will be great for you as graduate students is that half of the students are actually graduate students. So we're a little bit more like what you would see with the US college system or in Oxford and Cambridge, where we do encourage and get students to go through to graduate school. So we do have the highest proportion of grad students. We look after you and you'll see all sorts of specialist spaces. But these stories are also the coming together of being ranked seventh in the entire world for global mobility. So no matter what industry you're going into, people are going to respect and value that University of Melbourne students are flexible, they're adaptable and they've done really well. So the, our graduates have done a wonderful job of showing what we're all about. Now, I might actually invite Melissa on screen. We're going to look at some pictures and have a bit of a chat and you might have a few memories pop up. So, um, and we might need some technical help for Melissa to turn on her camera. And when she gets here, I'll get started but I know she's out there in the audience. So Alejandra, she may need a bit of help with her video. And what you can see is we're right in the heart of the city. We've got a traditional campus. 
And the really great thing about that, it means that you're able to go on placements really close um, nearby the campus. So essentially, it's, it gives you lots of opportunity to go out and practice what you're doing, form future connections. And we have over 100 different research research labs and things like that. So really connected. You can see a real mix of the old and the new. And that's because we were actually founded by academics from Oxford and Cambridge. And you've probably seen that the UK, they love to name things after places at home. They like to recreate places from home. Here is one of our incredible model, modern buildings. This was the first six star energy rated building in the, in, the, in the Southern Hemisphere. And it is so incredible that in summer, you think that there's air conditioning on, but there's not. And in winter, you think that it's really cold and there's heating on. It's just good, sustainable design. And this is where if you're doing architecture, planning, design, um, or anything like graphic design, this is where your studios will be. There are exhibition spaces, but many of you will also have classes there. You can see more of the old and the new, but importantly, what we try to do is develop opportunities outside the classroom, beyond internships, beyond bringing in industry, and um, as you can see, uh, lots of things. So University of Melbourne students don't just come to get a piece of paper. They come to make the most of all of the opportunities. So what you will find is that your classmates will also challenge you. They'll also help you see different perspectives on things. So I think one of the very best things that you can do at the University of Melbourne is learn and be inspired by your classmates. They come from over 160 different countries throughout the world. They're bright, they're talented, just like our Colfaturo students. So they represent some of the most ambitious students. And you can see lots of interesting spaces. Our campus has been the home to lots of film, TV, movies, and I might just ask if, if we've got, once they can get um, Melissa with us, that would be great. I think she might need someone to make her a speaker, but I'll keep going. Um, and you can see there are over 400 different clubs, including a really, really active postgraduate association that make sure to look out for you. So the special places on campus for our postgraduate students, we know the kinds of things that you need. And here you go. Here is the overwhelming part. There are over 400 courses at graduate level. So nearly over 400 different master's programs you can pick from. They align really well to the Colfaturo um, priority courses and areas. And you can choose it for many reasons, to continue following a passion, to level up for your career, and also maybe as a switch. So if you were doing one career and you want to move to another, there's different entry points for lots of different things. So with over 400 courses, you can imagine you can study just about everything. So we are a comprehensive university. And we're really proud because we don't just have one thing that we're good at, we rank highly across all areas from performing arts, arts, humanities and society, international relations to computer science, business, law, education. And you can see some of our rankings from QS here. And they're similarly or higher with times. So really important for your Colfaturo applications. And as I wanted to point out, these are the critical skills for the workforce now and even more so moving through. And as I was saying, this is part of our success of why we're number seven in the world for global employability. And it is for these very factors. So 
we will be building in this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary thinking in you. Um, you'll be practicing this collaboration with people from different teams. Really importantly, you can really see that these skills have emerged for successful careers as things have changed due to the pandemic. So people who were able to have novel and adaptive thinking to quickly be able to move the way they worked online to be effective in how they did that. Um, you did see a lot of interdisciplinarity there, pulling together teams with different skills. But you'll see this cross-cultural competency and social intelligence. These are really big things that we do at the University of Melbourne. So you will have that opportunity to put your lens over a question or a problem that you're solving in class and learn from others in your class. Our academics are also from all over the world. So really quickly, these are the kinds of ways that we help you with your practice. So practical trips, mentoring, we have a student success team and they will do everything from uh, do one on one appointments with you to talk through your career, help you get a job while you study, because you do get an automatic student visa when you study. There are professional clubs that, again, put you in touch with employers in Australia and globally. The alum network in Colombia is incredible. Um, they're highly active. And there's a lot of support for when you return home and you have this real sense of community. Another really big thing too is that there are all sorts of ways to practice and connect. We've got lots of great spaces that you would have seen in that little tour that I did. Some are specialist teaching. Some are places where you can be noisy in groups and work on things together. Some spaces are to hide out when you want complete quiet and obviously places to inspire, all free for students, but we also have the largest cultural collections in the Southern Hemisphere. So lots of galleries, lots of different things that you can do and even places to call home. So our accommodation, lots of different kinds available, different price points to suit you. And we guarantee an accommodation place for all international students. We also connect you even further. So you can come to the University of Melbourne, but you could have another international experience. You could go for a semester on study abroad or exchange. There are international field trips, volunteer opportunities and placements. So at the moment with our master's programs in education, we do have uh, teaching students who are out on approved placements in their home countries. So they're able to continue to get that important practice and we're making these sorts of things possible. We're gonna look after you in every sense of the word. And while study has been online, all of this is transferred online. So you can get academic advising, course advising, counselling. You can get any sort of support that you want, including from alum. So are there any scholarships for Colombian students? I'm really excited to tell you and scan the QR code on your screen. We have just added an additional 500 scholarships for our international students. These are merit-based scholarships and they start at 10,000 Australian dollar fee remission, but some will be much higher than that in particular courses. So that's the starting rate. You don't have to do anything to apply for these. You will actually get it automatically because we will automatically assess you for a scholarship when you apply. Now, we think that students that come to us from Cole Futuro are brilliant. And so you do get an automatic benefit. So what you can see on your screen is that there are automatic scholarships through fee remissions for our Cole Futuro beneficiaries. So as you can see, the Graduate School of Education are offering right up to 25% of your fees right across your time at the university. And then we've got the 15% that are going on in 
arts, humanities, and social sciences. So for those of you maybe interested in development, marketing and comms, translation, international studies, and also in engineering, architecture, building, planning. And then you've got your 10% there with business and law. So these are not the only scholarships, but these are ones that we've done especially for Colfer beneficiaries. So you'll also not have to pay an application fee. You'll just tick that you're applying for sponsorship or scholarship and you will not have to pay an application fee. So that's another way that we welcome Colfer applicants. And at the moment, I'll address the big question, when a board is opening, we are hoping and seeing signs that it will be next year. What we can say is that the university had our plan together last year. We are ready to welcome you back safely. We miss having students on our campus, but we're all ready to go. You'll be surprised by what we made possible online, which is everything from studios. We gave students licenses to the software they needed to ways of feeling connected to their classmates and teachers. This is actually a Melbourne School of Business lecturer. He's right here in the middle and he just wanted to get together with his students from all over the world, including Australia, bring a drink, your choice, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. And they just had a chat because many were under different restrictions throughout the world. Internships still occurred. So these were students doing internships with schools, with engineering firms, going out with governments, NGOs, uh, the UN. These are ways that students in science, they came up with what the experiments would be and right or wrong, they were demonstrated live. So if the students had picked something wrong, the demonstrators still did it so they could see what the outcome was. We did things like mailed out practical kits. So students got this in the mail all throughout the world. They joined online and they did their practical together. So lots of different platforms being used, lots of different ways of technology to do field trips. So essentially they did high production value video, joined things with Google Earth and GPS, and then had live components of the class with that. So the learning is not what you might expect. We've found lots of different ways to bring Melbourne to you. And this includes all of the support from course advising to actually being able to join clubs and events. So um, not a, a little further south from you, but we have a Paraguayan Student Association. They just held a massive conference that went for a week and they did that all online. There's been dance clubs who've choreographed pieces. We've had 104 different students in 104 different places play concerts. We've had live performances. We've had a club that even did a virtual escape room online. Some of the other great things are, you can actually have a personal trainer from Melbourne Sport who'll meet with you one-on-one -on -one and they'll say, What's the situation in your country? And if you say, well, actually we're sheltering or we're in lockdown and I live in a little apartment, they will come up with your personal training plan to do yourself at home. You can have regular check-ins with them. And there's also live group classes. We've streamed live bands out to students. All of our student festivals we've put online, all of our keynotes, all of our careers and employability. So your counselling sessions. And we've just introduced that you'll be able to get counselling if you need it in Colombia and in your own language. So it will also seek the time zone. So we've tried to think about the time zones for teaching if you do end up needing to start online. And so academics are available for longer consultation periods and they're really considered about that. And you'll see quite different timetabling from us. So what you can see here is when the borders open and you will be the first to know, and fingers crossed that it is semester one next year, we will be giving automatically the Melbourne Welcome Grant. 
And this pack will automatically be for all returning and commencing students, 4,000 Australian dollars plus a goodie pack with some Melbourne University merchandise. And you can use this money in any way that you like to get settled in Australia. So you can use it for flights, you can use it for books, you can use it for, you know, your accommodation, you can use it for anything that helps you get settled at living in Melbourne. And the goodie pack is pretty good too. So it's got some great Melbourne iconic things. It gives you a travel card and a hoodie. And as I said, just really quickly, lots of different accommodation options depending upon price. And I'll be able to give you the link to all of this. And lastly, how do we apply? So our academic year is a little bit different and what you'll see is here, I can't give you the overall graduate entry requirements because with the 400 different courses, they're all really different. So I've put what can sometimes be generally there, but some courses will require higher academic results or slightly lower for the minimum. But the majority will just be looking at your academic grades in your course that you're doing now or just finished however some that might be talent based like architecture or filmmaking or dance they will require folios interviews auditions and some of the really competitive courses in law or the business school or medicine they'll require additional tests like the GRE MCAT um, the GAMSAT personal statements but that is all outlined to you. So what do you do? You find the course that's your right fit. You ask lots of questions and they can be today, next week, a year's time, whenever you need, we're here. Check the admissions requirements. Now I'm gonna type in the chat box right now um, where you go to look at courses. And it has everything from the fees, to exactly what we needed to assess you for that course. And you can even link through to look at subjects. So if you're choosing between a couple of courses, my tip is actually go in and look at the subjects. And if you can't pick between all the subjects because you love them so much of one course, chances are that's the right course for you. Um, Another great thing that you can do if you want help in Colombia, we're always here to help you, but you can work with one of our representatives. So that's Aussie, LAE and AES, and they're located all throughout Colombia. And you can find their details on our website, but they can help you with everything from submitting your application and all of your documents to talking through courses. They're pretty much Melbourne um, in Colombia. I speak to them regularly and we know each other very, very well. They can also talk to you about things like visas and they're really familiar with applying to Colfituro. So there are the two intakes. Aussie, LAE and AES are really well aware of this. And even if you haven't met your English language criteria yet or you haven't quite finished university, we can make you what is based on uh, what's called a conditional offer and it will just say we'll have a look at how you're going so far and you'll get a letter of offer that will then say upon completing your degree and achieving these marks or upon your English language. So a quick snapshot I really had hoped that we would be able to make it possible I think we might do we have Melissa able to put her video and camera on yet? I'm hoping that we can, because she's here as a co-host. Melissa, I, I, are you able to join? Yes. Can you oh, see me? Oh, wonderful. I, I can see you now. So, Melissa, you studied at Melbourne and you have a fantastic career. Can you tell our audience a little bit about, and I'm going to show them some shots of Melbourne while you're speaking, and if you're familiar with any, jump in. But tell us a little bit about moving to Melbourne, how you chose your course and what you're doing now while I give them a bit of a tour of, of 
where you studied, the city that you studied and hopefully loved. So over to you. <laughs> okay. Hello, Zoe. Hi, everyone. All right. So as Zoe told you, my name is Melissa. I have a bachelor's degree in education in Colombia. I am a, I was a teacher before, like I just changed jobs, but I am originally a teacher. Um, and yeah, I studied foreign languages in Colombia, which means I am a professional teacher. And then what I did was a master's of educational management in Melbourne Uni. Mm -hmm. I went to Melbourne Uni in 2015. I did all my process in 2014. Uh, these kind of meetings and all that, they, they bring really nice memories because I participated in such things and I was very happy to get all the information I needed. Um, so yeah, I moved to Melbourne in February 2015. I got there and that was amazing. I have to say that you have to prepare very well economically because it's an expensive city. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know, I mean, I'm not wealthy and I made it. So I think that... Anybody can. I received the support from Col Futuro. I have to say it. I had no problem with Col Futuro at all. Never. Um, all the all of the money that I received was on time, and I have good news. And it is that I finished paying last June. Uh, I never had a problem. I have to say that. And yeah, so um, some things that you have to consider is money because you have to be prepared with some money in advance for rent for food or accommodation in general. And my experience at the university was amazing. Uh, I have to say that I did, as I told you, master in educational management. Um, and I didn't have class every day. It was like, it depends on the course. So for example, I had a course, uh, it was like related to psychology and education and it was intensive. So it was like the whole week I had to go like every day in the mornings but that was only like for three weeks. And then I started another one, which was uh, only Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, I remember that I even had a course on Sundays and that was about uh, philosophy. That was crazy because I mean, on a Sunday, you're tired. You're, <laughs> you know, you wanna be in your house and, you are, and then you are studying uh, philosophy in English, which was <laughs> not my, my language. And something like nice is that I remember on that day, it was Formula Uno, Formula One in Melbourne, you know, the cars and all that. And <laughs> everybody was there, all the Colombians I met in Melbourne were, they were like, you know, in Formula One and I was in class, but that was still good. I mean, I still love every there, second. There, are, there is quite a growing Colombian community in Australia and in Melbourne. And you clearly connected in some way with the Colombian diasporic community. And I guess I'm really keen to hear, as a Colombian, what surprised you about coming to Australia, coming to Melbourne? Was there something you weren't expecting or, yeah, what surprised you coming to Australia and Melbourne? I have to say that it is a very organised country. I mean, the ah. transportation system is amazing. It's from another world. I have to say that I, I have the opportunity to be in the States and in, in the United States. And yeah, when I got there, the transportation system was amazing. If you like, you can get to uni by train or by, uh, by tram, or you can have your own bicycle and you can ride to uni with no problem. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and it's very safe. You have no problem. I left the library. I remember uh, sometimes I didn't want to study in my house or sometimes I finished class and I didn't want to go back home. So I went to the library and I could leave the library at 9 p.m. Er, like, you know, dark parks and all that. And you had no problem at all. So that gives you a Brilliant. sense of confidence. Great. I, I have heard of students saying, staying at the library much, much later. So um we do have very dedicated students. What kind of other things did you get involved in? I know you had a pretty demanding course thinking about doing philosophy in second language, which is incredible. Um, I think that's representative of how clever our Colfaturo students are. Did you get involved in anything else, try out any new hobbies? What did you do with your friends? What else did you get involved in in Melbourne? <laughs> All right, I have to say, like, you know, in terms of hobbies and all that, well, my hobby was 
I'm not a nerdy student, I have to say, but still the library was, I was just delighted. So going there was amazing. I did have a, like, I did have a, a problem. Well, it was kind of a problem and it was with my writing skills. Um, ah. As I told you, I was a teacher in Colombia. I was actually an English as a foreign language teacher in Colombia. I got there and I remember my first assignment was a paper about leadership in education. So I did it with so much effort. I was like, you know, I have to do this. And I was like, and then when I submitted it, my lecturer, he said, Melissa, you have to improve your writing because your writing is not academic. So you need to do something. Oh my God, I got depressed. I said, no, I'm going to fail and I will lose the money from Cocuturo and all that. But then the university provided me some um, like special classes on writing. And they, this was a guy only for me. So we set some sessions, we set up some sessions and I went to see him and he helped me out with everything. So he didn't do my job or my assignment, but he, <laughs> said, he gave me tips for writing in English. Brilliant. So you would definitely, I think there's a really good tip for everyone out there listening. And it's the fact that, you know, you were open to the help, you asked for help and you took it and you worked on it. And I think that that's one of the big advantages of the university is that we do offer lots of different kinds of academic support. And it doesn't actually matter where in the world that you come from because students who've grown up with English as a first language or even the Australian version of English, I'm not sure if it sounds different from if you've been hearing US speakers or English speakers, even those students transitioning from either high school to undergrad, but particularly grad, um, undergrad to graduate, there's new ways of working. Um, academic language is different. There are different expectations. So there's chances that you will all be in that position where you want to work on something or develop skills further. So we make sure that you've got those opportunities. What other tips do you have for our audience who might be thinking about moving to Australia? What other tips, whether it's moving to another country to study or also coming to Melbourne, what's your advice to them? You just got to, like, you need to trust yourself because um, sometimes you feel scared about the language. Uh, you feel scared about the kind of lectures you are going to have because let me tell you, as Zoe was telling, was, was telling you, you get to have touch with really high-level lecturers. I mean, I remember I, I found my my lectures in books so i was reading a book about say marketing in education and then it was written by my lecturer so i said oh my god do i really have the chance to be in a class with these guys it was amazing and something very particular about my lectures i don't know about other courses is that they were very extremely nice so they were not like you know a how can i say conceive it conceited is the word like when they think that they are high profile so they can tell they cannot talk to you or anything no they were very humble and very open to you and what do you need and also i was the only colombian in class in the lectures there are many asian students i had friends from germany from asia in general singapore vietnam um what else germany well europe i had friends from yeah most of them from asia and then I had this German uh, friend and I was the only Latin American student. So they were like, oh, how does education work in Colombia and all that? So all the time, like you learn from them and they learn from you as well. That was my experience. I think I learned just as much from my classmates from different countries. And you will find it won't always be the case that you will be the only Latin American. It will just depend upon your courses. So we find in courses like the Master of Environment, we do tend to have a lot more people in general from the Americas. So both the USA and from throughout Latin America, because there's a really big focus and priority on sustainability and climate change and those kinds of things. We do have quite a lot of Latin American students in uh, Melbourne Law School as well, in the business school, and you'll find quite a lot of students from Colombia, um, Brazil, Paraguay in, in engineering. Doing international relations, engineering, perfect. Yeah, yeah we, we do. 
I it's it was probably a bit unusual in education that you were mm-hmm. the only Latin American, but maybe that's a bit of fun as well because I love you know, it. <laughs> you get to be unique, and um, that's exciting. But we're yeah. really really lucky so it does depend upon the course that you're doing but we might possibly need to hand back to Alejandra in a moment to talk through maybe take some questions and a little bit about Colfaturo but I did want to ask what is your tip for once students get to arrive in Melbourne they've got their Melbourne Welcome Grant they can do anything with it what are your must-dos in the city of Melbourne where did, where did you go to eat? Did you go to concerts? What did you do and what should they do? Everything is amazing. I mean, Melbourne was the, the, the city of my dream. You need to go to Federation Square. I used to live in Flinders Street, which is a main street oh. in Melbourne. So, yeah, I lived wow. in the city <laughs> the whole time. I, it was a really small apartment, but it was still amazing. I mean, and yeah, you need to go to Federation Square. You need to go to Grand Pians to see the kangaroos. That amazing <laughs> I had the opportunity to my parents went to my graduation so we took them to see the kangaroos as well um yeah so many things to do I even got sick I remember and oh. Melbourne Uni the the you know the health center they were all the time for me like available and helping me um and yeah you need to ride the tram every day because it's just amazing and yeah, make as many friends as possible. It is an opportunity that you cannot miss. And the university itself, like walking in there, it's like a dream. It's like you are in Harry Potter's movie or something. You are like, oh my God, where am I? I it's just amazing. I still love stepping on campus to this day, every single day. It definitely feels special. So do make sure to ask for help, join in with what you can basically do everything that Melissa did. So she sort of said yes to everything is is how we actually met. And that's what we do actually find in general about Latin American students. They definitely come to make the most of the time at the university. So we want you to live up to that expectation that's been set. Um, They start clubs, get involved in leadership projects, volunteer to come and talk to different students but I find it really exciting the really active alum networks so that alumni can help each other when you return and I guess you can have those memories of coming to the university that has 41 different places that you can get coffee on campus and the city of Melbourne has more restaurants and cafes per person than any other city in the world over 4,000 live gigs, but sounds like you were spending quite a bit of time in the library, Melissa. Um, But I just wanted to say thank you. And I think we should welcome back Alejandro from Cofuturo right now. And Melissa and I won't go far in case you want to take questions from either of us. I'm suspecting there might be a lot for Melissa. But yeah, welcome back, Alejandro. Uh, Over to you for now. Thank you. I'll be here. (laughs) Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. And someone have any question to Melissa from? Yeah, we'll get Melissa to come back just in case there's questions for you as well. <laughs> we don't have questions, but I have a question. Um, which recommendation will you give Melissa and Zoe about their time of preparation? I'm going to throw that to you, Melissa, because you went through that process. And if you feel you did it too late, give our audience all of your tips. If you feel you got it just right, the timing, give them all of your tips. So right from someone who's been here before. Over to you. Okay, thank you. So in terms of time, I think you like we it's September you have the perfect time like to apply if you want to go in February. Like I started my course, they started in February. Hopefully if you guys open borders and all that, this is the perfect time like for students or applicants to start the process and to go in February. That's like you are right on time because you have to do IELTS and you have to check with the university what the, the grades that you need and all the paperwork. So it's just perfect. September is perfect. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, Paula Hernandez, uh, I was wondering the um, 10,000 scholarships is accumulated with the confiturial. Uh, yeah, so this is how it would work. So number one, if you become a Colfaturo beneficiary, you will automatically get those fee remissions that I had on the screen. Um, and that will come off the cost of the overall course. So when Colfaturo pay that, they'll have a, an invoice with the reduced fee amount, depending upon your course, which was everywhere from 10% right up to 25% okay. for education. In terms of those scholarships, we do allow you to have those, but they are also fee remission. So it's not money to use how you like, and they are further performance based. The Melbourne Welcome Grant, you'll also get. So it doesn't matter if you're a Colfaturo beneficiary, you will also get that. And that will actually be, I guess, cash for you to be able to spend however you like. And so for students, I think a lot who I've been talking to already thinking I want to put it towards my flight or I might use it towards my accommodation and living expenses. So all sorts of things. But in this instance, um, the faculties that are doing these $10,000 scholarships of which they're, I, I'll share those slides with you. And AES, Aussie and LAE are aware of all of these scholarships but they are for the Faculty of Arts, which includes Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Faculty of Business and Economics. It's for Architecture, Building, Planning and Design, and also for Engineering and Information Technology. They're not our only scholarships. There are additional scholarships that you can apply for that I'm popping the link in the chat. And this is where you can put in that you're an international student interested in studying graduate study you can put in the particular field of interest say it is engineering and it will generate a list of all the additional scholarships that you're eligible for and these could be anything from accommodation right through to even sport or singing in a choir so there's lots of different opportunities that can help you can also work when you study with us so you're able to support your lifestyle in that way and you will automatically on your student visa be able to do part-time work and we have a career service to help with that. So lots of different ways you can add to the generous support from Colfer and lots of ways that we automatically recognise and benefit the excellence of students that come through Colfer So we know that we get wonderful, clever students like Melissa um, coming to us from there. So I hope that that answers your question. And that link also shows all the further detail about those scholarships, including the new expanded ones. So now okay. we've all... <laughs> Thank you. Diego asks, hi Zoe, I have a question. What is the schedule for PhD and requirements? What is the, sorry, I missed the first. Schedule, schedule for PhD. Yeah, so PhDs will be different depending upon the faculty that you want to study with. So some start students throughout the year, some have different intakes and start times. So the thing about applying for a PhD is it is really important to get the right fit for you here. So in most cases... Um, some of the STEM areas actually advertise particular PhD pos uh, positions and you can find them on the University of Melbourne website. So they might be looking for a PhD candidate for a particular research project in a specialist area. For the majority, if we're thinking things like arts, humanities, social sciences, um, even many parts of engineering, IT, education, law, business, you'll need to find a supervisor. And that's probably the biggest, um, biggest job for you. And there's lots of ways you can do it. I'm gonna give you some tips. Our researchers have so many students throughout the world and in Australia reach out to them. But what they do wrong is they send one generic email, which 
express an academic. So going back to the stories earlier, our academics are really passionate about what they do. The way that you can stand out is you can actually really personalise your message to them. So say to them, I really liked your research in this particular area. I thought this was really incredible for X, Y, Z reasons. And then talk about your own ambitions in that area. Show them how you would align and be a really good fit together. Um, This will be considered. This will be something that will make you stand out. And not many people do this. And I can assure you they love it because it shows that you really have thought through what you want to research, who you want to learn from, and maybe what contribution you can make. So we also have a find a researcher or find an expert search on the website. And that's where you can start if you've got no idea about who is out there that is working in the area that you want to. You may already have someone in mind. Another tip is we do do a lot of um, collaboration with academics in Colombia. Have a chat to your teachers and say, do you have someone you collaborate with at Melbourne or is there someone at Melbourne that is a leader in a particular area? They can also introduce you. They can put a word in for you and give you some tips. Chat to the alumni network. Um, They're very, very generous with their time. But the PhD process is a longer one for that very fact because it is important that you take that time to really make sure PhDs are hard work. You want them to be, but it's much better if you're excited about what you're doing, you're excited about your mentors, and it is a relationship that works both ways. So reach out to me. I'm going to pop my email in the chat. And let me know a little bit more about the PhD area that you're interested in. And I can send you through some more information about when you can start and how to apply and how to start looking for a researcher and maybe make suggestions and intros. So there is my email in the chat box. But yeah, I would need a bit more information from you there. But they're my general tips to stand out. Our academics love that. Thank you. Javier asks, I have a question about IELTS test. Do I have to retake the IELTS test in case I received the results in January 2020 before the COVID border restriction? Um, which year was that again? Sorry, 2019, was it? January 2020. Oh, you will be fine. They They stay current for two years, but that would include if you're applying for semester one, that remains current. And we've been a lot more flexible in terms of of that because we know it's been hard for students to get to testing centres, but in your case, it will be all good. And for those of you, if you haven't done a test yet, you can actually do the TOEFL online at home if you're not able to get to a testing centre. So that's something new that we introduced during the pandemic. But the good news is 2020, you are definitely still fine to be applying for semester one. It's current. Good news. (laughs) Thank you. Paula Hernandez, also have a question for Lisa. How much money do you recommend having in advance before you arrive at Melbourne? I'm going to throw to Melissa um, on this particular one. (laughs) Yeah, and it I don't will know. depend so, upon your lifestyle that you want as well. Absolutely. I was going to say that. So because, no, that is always like, um, how can I say that? Like an amount of money that the university recommends students to have. I think it's like 300, no, 400 a week. Is it correct? Sorry. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. So if you That's want Australian to okay, dollars. Yes, Australian dollars. But if you want to, like, to, to be okay, and, you know, as Zoe was saying, it depends on your lifestyle, but I would be, like, a month, so maybe 1,600, maybe, or maybe 2,000, you have to go well prepared. I mean, it's better in case you have an emergency or something. It also gives you those opportunities to, I guess, you know, travel within Australia or New Zealand or Indonesia. It also gives you opportunities to go and see bands and go out and things like that, but do remember you will be able to um, work as well to supplement your income. And the other great thing to point out too, if you do 
in the end have to start online in semester one, that will not impact your post-study visa too, because I know that that's a question we often get from students. So you'll also get that post-study visa to stay in Australia afterwards. So thanks for that, Melissa, that's good. But it does depend upon the lifestyle that you want. <laughs> I can see another one from Maria and it's about the Master of Environment and she is looking at the course page which is where you should go to look at fees because they're all different and she's asking about the variation in price because it says between 77,000 Australian to 93,000. Now I can tell you I can't give you an exact fee and this is because courses have a range because it depends upon the subjects that you pick. And with the Master of Environment, it's so broad. It's taught by nine of the 10 different faculties. Some students choose a real policy style major. Others might choose more of a hard science type major and others might choose something in between. So if you do particular subjects that are more in labs where you're looking at climate change and things like that, they require specialist spaces, extra demonstrators, specialist materials. So that subject will cost more. If you are doing more of an environmental policy type subject or law, they are less likely to sort of have those additional needs and they pretty much need a classroom, some great tutors, inspiring teachers and researchers. So those subjects will cost less. So essentially, if you are choosing more of the arts, humanities, law, policy side of environment, it'll be around that 77,000. But if you choose something that's much more sort of practical in science that involves, I guess, more materials like something like climate science or sustainability, uh, geology or something like that, that's where your price goes up. So I hope that that helps. And then you can actually see, you know, you can get a bit of advice on what it might look like for your subjects. So I know that one's a bit of a frustrating one because it, it sort of makes it harder to plan. But that's the rule. If you are choosing kind of those less sciencey ones, it will be cheaper. So you will see that variation with other courses as well. But a lot of the graduate ones are just a fixed fee. So if you look at something like the Master of International Development, it's just got one fee. But it's where there's a lot of choice and interdisciplinarity that you'll see that variation. So I hope that that helps. Um, okay. Now, we do have one other question there from Christian, and it's about applying. So we've heard Melissa's tips, but the documents. Um, so if you work with any of our official representatives from LAE, AES or Aussie, or you can contact me and we can help you at the university, you will know which documents you'll need. So mostly you will need your university results, so your testema. Um, and as I said, we can assess you with your results, even if you haven't finished and give you a conditional offer. You'll need to send through, once you do it, your English language tests, so your proof of English language. And again, we can give you a conditional offer to meet the English language requirements as well. And we'll obviously need um, proof of your identity and that kind of thing. So usually your passport or something like that. But depending upon the course, you may need other documents. So if you are doing, uh, looking at the MBA or a Master of Taxation Law or something like that, a document might be a personal statement or it might be sitting the GMAT or the GRE. But that is all outlined if you need to do that for the individual course. But the basics are your English, your results and your proof of identity. But um, there is a checklist on the website of what you need to make sure to do. And also all of our friends and colleagues at those agencies. So Aussie, AES and LAE, they use all of those checklists and they're really familiar with it. So we hope that makes it easy for you. Um, Thank you so much. Sorry, the time is up, but all of you can send uh, the question from the email that Sue uh, right pop up here again. in the chat. Yes. And also you have questions about the Cofuturo scholarships. You can write to...
and we will answer all the questions. So I thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Melissa, for the presentation. All the information was very, very useful. So thank you so much. Thanks so much for having us. And I just want to say, lovely to see you, Melissa. Thank you again. I think it's always thank important you. Bye -bye. To, to get real tips from someone who's been here before. So thank you for having me. Reach out and enjoy your evenings. Thanks again, Alejandra, for having me. And thanks, okay. Melissa. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Have a good day, Zoe. I will. Bye -bye. <laughs> I'm in the future, everyone. <laughs> See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>